Now let's hear from someone who recently left Ukraine, someone we've been speaking to on this program. Days after Russian forces began their attack, we spoke to Terrell Germain Starr, a journalist in Kyiv. For everyday people, how are they deciding whether to stay or to go? It depends. One, do you have the resources to go? I mean, you know, being able to leave the country, making sure that you have the proper documents to go, um, going someplace and having being able to pay for uh, housing. Uh, everybody doesn't have the luxury of doing that. People died to defend their democracy here, and they don't want to feel like they're just being pushed out of their land because Putin wants to be a bully. That's Terrell Jermaine Starr. He's a senior non-resident fellow at the Eurasia Center with the Atlantic Council, host of the podcast Black Diplomats, and he joins us here in studio. Mr. Starr, welcome. Hey, thank you. So you're like 24 hours back in the U.S. Pretty much. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> my mind and my body is still in the country, to be quite honest with you, and I miss my friends, but I really need to come back to um, kind of uh, recalibrate my mind, but I'm, I'm fine. I, f I still miss the country, and I'm still getting used to being here in the States. What do you miss? What do I miss? Well, you know, it's not about so much about what I miss. It's so much about what I'm used to. I'm used to explosions. And so now I'm in New York City, which is, loud, which is already loud. And you but it ain't quite things. that loud. It ain't quite that loud. Right. But then also you hear just sudden sounds, and it just kind of um, brings back some type of memory of you being back. You hear some type of explosion. You think it's an ammunition or something like that. But it's not so much about what I, I mean. I miss my friends, obviously, but most they are just sounds that I'm, getting, that I'm getting used to not hearing. You said that you, you told me before we started... Uh, the show that you meant to be in Ukraine for like three weeks. Correct. And you ended up being there for three months. Correct. So when you were there, did you have an inkling that something might happen that would keep you there longer? Or like how much of what's transpired did you see coming and how much did you not see coming? Absolutely. So I was in Georgia in 2008 when the Russians attacked there. So here in Ukraine, I knew that there was a pretext. There was a history of Putin uh, making these types of decisions, and so I figured that there was a strong possibility that an invasion would take place, and I decided to stay, and I figured I would be useful in collecting stories. Didn't know what those stories would be, didn't know what the outcomes would be. It's my first time in a country where I'm a journalist and actually getting information, and so, uh, you know, listen, for this, for, for uh, uh, capture live, capture, um, did live shoots from my neighborhood where buildings were hit. Um, by direct Russian, um, you know, missile strikes. I have covered people who are leaving the country, um, worked with uh, territory defense units, um, capturing their work and what they've done, uh, duck the missile strike um, by a couple hundred meters. So, A, uh, a lot of things, I, I, I knew something would happen, but not what I discussed. You, we just showed that picture of you putting on a helmet that you said was some of your new daily wear. You also <laughs> yes. shared a lot of images from the ground after some of the apparent Russian airstrikes. Uh, one tweet you wrote, what kills many folks in missile strikes isn't the hit itself, but the shrapnel. Many cars are cut up like Swiss cheese. Another video you tweeted, you just wrote, thank God there were no fatalities at this Brovary strike. Talk about what you learned from being on the ground in Ukraine that maybe is harder to see just from our perspective watching it here in the U.S. Well, depending on where you are, just the day-to-day -day of just surviving. Now, if you're in Mariupol, if you're in, in, in uh, Kharkiv, for example, where the cities are being demolished, then you're just, you know, the, it, it's kind of like the lottery almost, as a friend of mine described. You know, a missile can hit your, uh, it's a strong chance that a missile can hit your building. You know, you likely won't, but uh, the chance that one of those, uh, those missiles could hit you, very high possibility. But also just the idea of how, you know, the decision to leave. There are a lot of elderly people who are there and people who refuse to go. And then once they realize that the problems are a lot worse than they think, then they want to, uh, they, then they rethink. But another thing that I noticed there is that, you know, it's interesting when you're in a war country. There's, there, there are those cities that are constantly bombing. You have a place like Kiev where you're, you know, you're in bed and you're, you hear the explosion about 10 kilometers away. But at the same time, people have, there's some certain normalcy in life. I mean, people are going out and they're shopping, they're getting milk. You're like a little like, insulated yeah, from yeah, it a bit. Yeah, they, to, to some extent. But then, again, about 10 minutes walk from where I live, a missile hit a building and, you know, people died. With regards to people staying or going, you talked about how you've helped a few people try to get out of country. And we have talked about the presence of people of African descent in Ukraine. I think I was among those who was surprised yeah. to know that there was a population there, like a vibrant Absolutely. population of diverse people from all over the world. What's your view in terms of what you saw with people of African descent, especially 
trying to get out, trying to get west from Lviv through Poland. There have been a lot of controversy about race affecting the refugee outflow from Ukraine. Yeah, so absolutely. So the, 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 the conversation about racism, that's always been there, right? So it didn't take a refugee crisis or a war in order for us to see that there is racism in Ukraine or Poland or these other Eastern European countries. You know, when tragedy hits, it exacerbates whatever problems exist, right? It's not even unique to Ukraine per se, but you know, during the first few weeks, you definitely, um, the, the cases of racism and people being mistreated at the border definitely were true. Uh, one of the things I've noticed over the weeks, however, is that when that large Russia people went out, um, you start hearing fewer and fewer reports. Now, there are reports of people who are getting stuck in Poland um, by Border Patrol over the that side. Even when they leave Ukraine, that was a, uh, an investigation done by the Independent out of London. And so you, then you have some people who go through, with, um, go through Border Patrol without a problem. And so you have that as well. Now, what we are doing, what I'm currently I'm working on, is talking with people who are black Ukrainians, people who were, um, you know, because there's still stories to be had about these groups of people. Because one of the fundamental issues, and I've, and I've heard this by some people, um, African students who left, is that they, you know, when you're, you're in a country, you prepare to go to school. Right. You don't prepare for a war and having the financial resources to leave. Because I'll tell you, man, I paid for the leave from Kiev, going to the border with the last person. I took it, it cost $600. People don't have that money. Yeah. You know, so it's, so it's not cheap. Let me get to a few audience questions before I got to let you go. Virginia asked, the arguments Putin uses to justify the invasion of Ukraine worked for him when he invaded and destroyed Chechnya. Putin has a history of committing acts of violence and blaming those he wishes to target and eliminate. Do you think the world recognizes this? Well, yeah, so I think the world not only recognizes it, I think what they're recognizing is that Ukraine is not Chechnya. I mean, they don't have you know, um, defense systems that can, shoot, that can shoot missiles in the case of Chechnya, right? And then I think another thing, too, is that what, what really shows you how crazy um, Putin's thinking is is that he thought that this would be Chechnya, and he did sell this whole idea of Ukrainians would be liberators. But, you know, there, there, is, um, there are plenty of examples in, in, in Russian history, whether it be the Soviet Union, uh, for example, where they underestimated or had a lack of sophistication about the people that they were targeting, particularly with black people in the United States. You know, but that's a whole other thing. But then you also have a situation where uh, the Ukrainian people are fighting back and you have uh, people who, you know, they haven't fought, a, uh, the Russians have not fought a military like Ukraine, ironically. Yeah. yeah. One, one more of our viewers asked why you were in Ukraine in the first place and whether you lived there before the war started. I lived there before the war started. It's full bright grantee. In 2009, 2010, studied Russian language, uh, did a project on black Ukrainians, interestingly enough, that, we, you know, earlier we are talking about that. And uh, I was there to start a tourism company. That's not going to happen this year. Right. But I'm actually going to, and I'm working on a, resale, a clothing resale business of um, Western Ukrainian um, um, clothing. And so that's still ongoing. But I was there to start a business, but um, went in there and then started covering the war. <laughs> yeah. Before I let you go, I, I'm just wondering how... How you're doing? I know it's only been like 24 hours right. since you got back, but like, are you okay? I'm, How are you? Well, thank you. I pretty much, I talk to a, a therapist and talk about the things that I've seen and what I've experienced because the thing about war, regardless of what aspect of it you see, um, it, it's terrible. It's not something that anyone ought to go through. It's psychologically, um, it, it breaks you down psychologically. And so there are a lot of people who don't have access to therapy treatment like I do and desperately need it. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm fine, but I'm becoming more proactive about ways that I can help. I'm going back to Ukraine in July, as a matter of fact. So while I'm here, work with different organizations so I can figure, use my platform to send money to people who need it most. Well, I appreciate you making time to talk to us. I appreciate you taking care of yourself. Uh, I'm sure you're glad to be able to get back to the barber shop and live yeah. a little bit of a normal <laughs> life. But it's been really helpful to have you here to kind of walk us through what's going on from the ground. Terrell Jermaine Starr, appreciate you, brother. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.